Hi, and welcome to the uh, online cause inference seminar. Today, we are very excited to have uh, Stefan Wager, who will talk about treatment effects in market equilibrium. Uh, he will stop from time to time and take questions. Um, so please submit your questions in uh, Q&A. In Q&A, we also have uh, one of his collaborators, Evan Munro, who will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, after that, uh, we will have a discussion by Frederick Xavier from Yale University. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, questions today will be handled by Michael, so I'm quickly switching over to him now. Uh, thanks, Dominic. Um, so in Q&A, we have Evan Monroe, uh, so please submit uh, all your questions. Uh, Stefan will also stop from time to time to take questions live, so um, we may ask you whether you'd like to uh, ask your question uh, live, uh, in which case I'll reach out to you and ask you to raise your hand. Uh, just keep in mind that the talk is being recorded if you uh, choose to uh, ask your question live. And uh, when you submit questions, do so through the, the Q&A box uh, on Zoom. Uh, the chat uh, should be used only if you have a, uh, you know, an issue that you want to uh, direct to the panelists. Uh, so with that, Stefan, please start whenever you're ready. Right. Uh, well, thanks, thanks everyone uh, for being here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today I want to talk about uh, treatment effect um, estimation in marketplace equilibrium. Um, and the motivation here is, um, I assume in, in many of us um, here, especially kind of in collaboration with tech companies, end up running a lot of experiments in what amounts to a marketplace, people interacting uh, with each other via prices, supply and demand, and so forth. And so the point of this talk is to study what happens when you run experiments in this kind of setting um, and kind of uh, give the setting some foundations in terms of a classical uh, potential outcomes based model. So uh, this is uh, joint work with Evan Monroe and Pong Xu. Um, Evan uh, is a PhD student in econ at Stanford GSP, and Kwong uh, is a colleague of mine here, uh, also at the GSP. So anyways, uh, when we study experiments, most of the time uh, we work in a uh, no interference setting uh, where the treatment given to one person only affects that person. And this sometimes makes a lot of sense. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a clinical trial, uh, trying to see if a new surgery is better than an old surgery, it makes a lot of sense to assume that the surgery you get affects you, but doesn't affect anyone else. Uh, so far, so good. But there are a lot of settings where this kind of no interference assumption just doesn't make sense. If you're trying to understand the effect of vaccines on disease uh, uh, contagion, um, if you're running an experiment to study the effect of canvassing on voter turnout, um, or if you're trying to run an experiment to study the effect of agricultural subsidies on agricultural production. Uh, more broadly, uh, if you're running any kind of randomized trial in a setting where you have a bunch of people who are interacting with each other and may talk about the experiment and may kind of uh, do things to each other, um, then this kind of no interference assumption becomes um, clearly implausible. Um, so if we want to study randomized trials, uh, we need to, um, we can't just use uh, theory developed under the no under, uh, interference assumption out of the box, we need to do something else. Um, and it's actually even a little worse than that. Uh, most surveys of causal inference, and when I teach uh, this stuff, I'm also guilty of this, um, will go for a class nine weeks out of 10, uh, we're gonna work in the no interference case, treat this as kind of the normal setting. And then you have one week where you talk about interference and okay, talk about how standard assumptions could break and, and what you can do about it. But the more you dig into this, the, the more this view maybe doesn't um, uh, hold scrutiny. Uh, these problems, understanding the effect of vaccines on infection or understanding the effect of agricultural subsidies on production, these are very different problems. The only point in common is that somehow abstractly they involve interference, but kind of randomized trials of vaccines may have more to do with standard no interference trials than 
they have to do with randomized trials of agricultural subsidies. So once you allow for interference, you don't just need kind of one alternative theory of randomized trials that allows for interference. You potentially need many of them um, that allow you to build in interference in different application relevant ways. So having said that, today I want to focus on interference in one context, that is interference that arises through marketplace effects, which as I'll explain uh, more soon, is interference that arises by kind of people changing their behavior and this change in prices that then affects the incentive landscape for everyone else in the marketplace. So anyways, before going there though, I just want to first give a brief survey of um, standard analysis of randomized trials in the no interference settings and also talk about some standard ideas how to deal with interference uh, to kind of give foundations uh, for what we can do in a marketplace setting. All right, I'll go over this very quickly because this I'm sure is familiar to everyone here. Uh, basic analysis of randomized trials, uh, right? Go back to Neyman. Um, the idea is that to measure the effect of a binary treatment on a real valued outcome, you posit potential outcomes, y0, y1, corresponding to the outcome you would have observed if the IT unit had been treated or not. And the main result is that if treatment is randomized, and that is uh, your treatments WI are exogenous Bernoulli coin flips uh, with probability pi, then the difference in means, the average of the treated and untreated units is unbiased for the average treatment effect, which is the average difference in potential outcomes. This is very nice. Uh, it's very robust results, needs essentially uh, no assumptions. Um, we, but um, of course, what's the limitation here? It's when you wrote down these potential outcomes, yi0, yi1, then you effectively ruling out any possibility of interference. If, if I can talk about yi0, this is the outcome you would have observed if kind of you received control, there's no room in this notation to talk about, well, how would your friend being, be, being treated or control um, affect your outcome? So when there's interference, we need to kind of expand this notion to allow for the possibility of interference. Um, now your outcomes don't just depend on the treatment you receive, they depend on the treatments everyone else in the study uh, might also receive. Um, and so now if there are N people in the study, each of them could be treated or not treated. And there are two to the N ways treatment could be assigned in the whole study. Um, and so this means that in principle, there could be two to the N potential outcomes. Uh, then we're gonna assume that this bold face W, this is uh, the two to the N, um, uh, this indexes the treatments received by everyone in the study and the treat outcome you actually received is the potential outcome indexed by this full treatment vector. This is of course a much richer setting. There are many ways to model these potential outcomes. There are many questions you can ask um, and kind of choices you make here are can depend on what application setting you're in. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with kind of what question we're gonna focus on. And throughout this talk, I'm gonna to try to measure uh, the average direct and indirect effects of treatment. Um, these are essentially parameters that attempt to be best analogs to the average treatment effect, but in a way that allows for the presence of interference. So the first of these, the average direct effect, um, it's a very simple parameter to think about. It's the effect of, on average, the average effect of treating the IT unit on the IT unit's outcome. So if there were no interference, you're asking what is the effect of the WI on YI, that's just the average treatment effect. And in the no interference, effect, interference case, in fact, that direct effect matches the average treatment effect. Now, when there is interference, we have to deal with that. Um, and the way we do it is we just marginalize over everyone else's treatment. treatment. So here I'm gonna uh, measure the effect of toggling WI from zero to one on YI while marginalizing over everyone else's treatment assignment. This expectation here, um, is only over this treatment assignment here. Oh, uh, uh, th these potential outcomes are taken as fixed. So this is a direct effect. It's a very natural generalization of the average treatment effect um, to the interference setting. 
Um, there's another kind of mirror image as demand uh, that's a little trickier to think about, but whose motivation is very similar. This is the average indirect effect. It's the average effect of your treatment on everyone else. So it's the average effect of WI on all the YJs for J not equal to I, again, marginalizing over everyone else's treatment. Uh, this is a little more delicate to think about, uh, but if you think the direct effect, that is the average effect of WI on YI, marginalizing over others, um, is reasonable to think about, then why not? Why shouldn't the average indirect effect also be um, interesting to think about? And the indirect effect is a direct um, uh, is a, is an immediate uh, way of measuring the strength of interference effects. In particular, if there's no interference, then the average indirect effect is zero. For this talk, uh, I'm going to take a very statistical approach, meaning that I wrote down two estimates here, and I'm going to devote the rest of the talk to building point estimates and confidence intervals. Um, I do want to kind of note that there are many reasons to care about these parameters. One is just that they're interesting in and of themselves. But another is that in general, if you take the sum of the direct effect and the indirect effect, then you get a policy effect, a total policy effect. So in this paper with Hu and Li, uh, we showed that if you take the, in a lot of generality, if you take the sum of the average direct effect and of the average indirect effect, then you get dd pi of the expected value of y in an experiment where treatment is randomized with policy pi. So this is one total policy effect. And you can go further still, and, and we do so in the paper. Uh, for example, if what you're interested in is some continuous lever, say a tax, and you want to understand how raising or lowering the tax uh, would affect an outcome of interest, then we show how you can design experiments uh, for which the sum of the average direct and indirect effects matches D kind of your outcome of the interest to D tax, um, which is kind of, so we can design experiments where if you can estimate these direct and indirect effects, then you get the policy effect you care about. So that's the question. Uh, to, to make progress though, uh, you can always write down these questions, what is the direct and indirect effect? Estimating them is a little trickier though, uh, because under interference, if uh, you have two to the n potential outcomes for every person that are completely unrestricted, um, then it seems essentially impossible to make much progress. So we need to impose some more structure on the potential outcomes. And here, the standard way of doing so is using an exposure mapping. Um, the, and, the, and the idea is that each unit has some functions fi, that tell you how you can collapse these full treatment vectors into equivalence classes. Um, so for the ith unit, you have a function fi, so that if you have two treatment vectors, so full assignments for n people, uh, that for which fi of w is equal to fi of w prime, then the potential outcomes also match. Um, you could equivalently think of this as something like an exclusion restriction, meaning that you can write that the realized outcome is yi of fi of w. And then kind of different choices of exposure mapping may lead to different types of interference. The simplest exposure mapping is the no interference exposure mapping, fi of the whole w vector is just wi. You only care about your own treatment, but there are other examples that are very nice to think about. For example, uh, this paper by Bassadol, uh, look at a, an exposure mapping where essentially we run experiments on students in families and the exposure mapping only cares about the treatments received in your family, but not in other families. And there are many kinds of exposure mappings you could try to build. Um, one direction that kind of where the literature has been going that kind of captures a lot of things uh, people like to do is you write down a graph, um, you put all the units in your trials at uh, vertices of the graph, and then your exposure mapping is that essentially, if you look at outcomes at node four, well, you care about your own treatment assignment and you care about treatment assignments for your neighbors in the graph, uh, but you don't care about anyone else's treatment assignment. And then there are many things you might ask about, for example, how do you design permutation tests that can 
uh, evaluate various null hypotheses um, under this kind of um, graph exposure mapping model. So this was a brief survey of how people often think about interference and how kind of you can expand out potential outcomes um, to allow for interference that goes beyond this kind of standard uh, randomized trial uh, analysis. And now again, uh, the focus of this talk is on interference that arises through price effects in marketplaces. And to kind of expand on the example I had on the first slide, um, suppose we wanted to evaluate the effect of agricultural subsidies on corn production. You could imagine running a randomized trial where you give some farmers a subsidy, you don't give other farmers a subsidy, and you see if the farmers who receive the subsidy produce more corn. Um, maybe in the randomized trial, the subsidized farmers end up producing a lot more uh, than the non-subsidized ones. So you think that the subsidy is very effective in increasing corn production. But maybe if you give the subsidy to everyone, then nationwide, you end up producing too much corn. Uh, this depresses prices. And in the end, the fact that the prices are lower mean that farmers actually don't want to produce more corn. Um, and so, so, and this kind of prices going uh, down may kind of decrease uh, the effect of the subsidy on production. So there's clearly interference. Uh, subsidies given to one person may reduce the prices faced by others. Uh, so we need to account for that. Uh, but this superficially seems very far from the standard um, interference setting. There's no graph here. You, like, I don't care if the producing a person producing more corn is my neighbor or anyone else in the country. All I care about is that they're producing in the same marketplace as me. Um, and this is affecting my prices. Uh, so this leads to a question, how can we statistically capture these interference effects? And I'll just quickly pause in case there are any questions here about the preliminaries. There are no uh, open questions, so you can continue. Great. Thanks. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. So anyways, um, how are we going to do this? Um, I, I should note that there is some literature on how to um, run um, experiments um, in this kind of marketplace setting. Um, a lot of it kind of very applied, um, coming out of um, tech companies even directly. And for a while, I have to admit, I, I actually thought that this kind of running experiments in a marketplace setting, which is very different from the kind of standard interference literature with exposure mapping and so forth, and that these were going to be kind of two disparate trends of literature. Uh, but it turns out that doesn't need to be the case. Um, and even though superficially the setting where equilibrium effect arises through price effects looks very different from the classical interference setting, you can do everything using the same formalism if you're just careful. And so okay, what's the setting? We want to measure uh, the effect of a treatment, WI, on an outcome, YI, where interference arises because of marketplace effects. And what we're going to assume is that this marketplace, equi marketplace equilibrium is characterized by a set of prices for capital J goods that are going to mediate all interference effects. So I'm a farmer, you're a farmer. I don't care about what you're doing other than to the fact that the fact that you're producing more or less changes the prices of various goods on the market, and this affects my options. And it turns out that this fact, uh, you can capture it using an exposure mapping, just as before. The fact that all interference is mediated through prices is saying nothing more than if for the ith unit, if the treatment given to the ith unit, uh, it takes on some value and kind of the full treatment assignments W and W prime yield the same prices, then the potential outcomes for the ith unit are the same. So uh, you care about, this means that you can collapse notation again, you care about prices, you care about your treatment, and then your realized outcome is a function of the treatment you receive and prices. The construction of this exposure mapping looks pretty different from what you typically have in a graph, 
uh, but the, but the idea is the same. Um, and this is probably a gratuitous doodle, uh, but I just wanted to, <laughs> in case it helps anyone, I just wanted to write it down. So in the general interference setting, you have kind of n people in the study. You have n binary treatment assignments. You have n outcomes. And all the treatments can affect all the outcomes. And here, the assumption in the marketplace setting is we have all the direct effects. So wi can always affect yi. But we remove all the cross edges for treatment. And instead, it's just kind of interference arises by w's yielding a price, and then this price affecting people's outcome. And you can capture this in terms of an exposure map. So this is the, the general model. And of course, this leads to a number of questions. Uh, first, I just said that interference effects are mediated by prices. How do these prices form? Where do they come from? This is the first thing to ask. Um, then once we have a notion of where prices come from, what do the average direct and indirect effects look like? Do they look like something reasonable that we want to estimate or do they look crazy? And finally, if we buy that there's something interesting we want to estimate, then how can we design estimators for them? So a number of questions. First on prices. Um, and here, essentially we're gonna assume that prices arise by matching supply and demand. Um, a little more specifically, um, we're going to follow this approach uh, by Angers, uh, Grady, and Imbens, um, who essentially looked at supply and demand functions as potential outcomes. So essentially, for everyone in an agricultural marketplace, uh, I can define, say, your potential supply is how much corn would you have produced given some treatment status and given some uh, marketplace prices. And then uh, the way prices arise is that equilibrium prices match supply and demand, given these kind of supply and demand potential outcomes. Um, I think this is kind of intuitively very reasonable. You also, if you're actually doing the math, you're going to want to worry about uniqueness of prices. Um, there are standard results in econ that yield uniqueness of prices. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it there but I just wanted to uh, flag this as something uh, to worry about. So prices arise by matching supply and demand. Um, and once you've said this, actually, the model is fully specified, right? You, 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 have, you have prices, they mediate all interference. What are the average direct and indirect effects? Uh, well, I had a definition before, and you can write it down, right? The direct effect is the effect of toggling WI on YI. And the indirect effect um, is the effect of toggling WI on other outcomes. So in a way, if you wanted, you could just say, this is the indirect and direct effect. There's nothing more to say. But I think first, it's kind of very hard to stare at this, these quantities and see, do you actually care about them or not? So they look a little unintuitive. And second, of course, even if we did care about them, we need to know how to estimate them. So, there is still something uh, to do here. Um, and OK, how are we going to make progress? Um, until now, I've done everything in the setting where I just kind of wrote down potential outcomes conditioned on the potential outcomes. And the only thing that was random was the treatment. Um, but to make some progress at this point, it's helpful to move into a population setting and assume that potential outcomes are drawn IID from a distribution. Um, so specifically, the relevant potential outcomes for everyone are first your outcome, um, your demand curve, and your supply curve. And the fact that I have an IID sampling model also means that I can define these mu uh, D and S functions for kind of various expected potential outcomes. And our first result is that in the large sample limit, as kind of types of marketplace participants are drawn IID from a distribution, um, relevant quantities converge. First, the equilibrium prices that arise by matching supply and demand um, are going are gonna to converge to a limit P star, uh, where P star, as you'd hope, uh, is the thing that matches expected supply and demand. So 
prices are going to converge. That's the first result. And then the second result, uh, the one we really care about, is that in probability, these S demands, the average direct and indirect effect, are also going to have limits. Um, in a no interference case, we know this very well. Right? The thing I wrote down, the average difference in potential outcomes, this is what's often called the sample average treatment effect um, in the literature. And it's well known that under a population sampling model, the sample average treatment effect converges to the population average treatment effect, that is the expected difference between the treated and potential uh, control potential outcomes. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, what's cool is that in this sampling model, in a large marketplace setting, uh, the direct and indirect effects also has, have limits, and that these limits um, can be expressed uh, in terms of these expected potential outcome functions. So you, you, you have convergence here. Uh, from now on, I'll just write tau star ADE and tau star AIE for these large sample um, direct and indirect effects. So you can write them down. And actually, not only can you write them down, but these kind of have nice interpretations. Um, the direct effect, it's what you'd hope. It's essentially, it matches the average treatment effect you get in a study where you just kind of, instead of letting prices float, you just forced the prices to be um, the equilibrium price. And then you measured the kind of no interference average treatment effect um, in this experiment where uh, you, you had the equilibrium price there. So you get this kind of mean field uh, phenomenon where kind of people don't care about each other's kind of specific behavior. Everyone just cares about the average behavior of everyone else in the marketplace. The average indirect effect is a little trickier. Uh, this is kind of a bigger formula. Uh, but again, what's cool is that first, this only depends on kind of these expected potential outcome functions. Uh, and, and what's more, you look at it, you see things like D outcome, D price. This is kind of a very familiar notion in econ, that's kind of version of a price elasticity. And so what's cool is that these indirect effects, again, turn into, have limits uh, that you can understand in terms of um, uh, familiar quantities. I think there are questions at this point, so I'll pause uh, quickly to take questions. Uh, sure, yeah, I think I have, we have a question from uh, Peter Hall, so I'm gonna unmute him now. All right. Can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Stevan. This is super interesting. I'm just wondering if you could maybe try and relate this a little bit to um, you know the usual notion in econ where you have these shocks. They're sort of only affecting the supply side or the demand side. And we we make those exclusion restrictions. I think because we're interested in tracing out the demand curves or the supply curves. I think this was the case in the original Angus Grady Imbin's paper. I'm wondering, you don't seem to require that here. And I think that's just because you're not interested in estimating supply and demand curves, just the sort of equilibrium price function. And so you don't actually care, you know, what curve you're tracing out as long as you have the sort of reduced form mapping of the shocks through prices. Is that right? Or am I missing something? And, and if so, is that part of what you meant by sort of regularity conditions before that you need some unique price function that arises from these shocks? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and so to be clear here, what I've done so far is I've talked about a bi binary experiment and I've talked about just describing abstractly what are the direct and indirect effects of this binary uh, intervention. Uh, I haven't talked about how to estimate it yet. And in order to estimate the indirect effect, it actually turns out that as far as I know, uh, you need an additional source of exogenous variation um, to be able to um, estimate this quantity. So, and this is this is where it connects to kind of uh, the, the the classical econ idea of shifting uh, supply and demand curves. Um, essentially, the the way this is often going to be done is there are going to be many marketplaces um, where, in kind of different marketplaces, you 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 can shift uh, supply or demand up or down, and you can go in that type of direction to estimate price elasticities. And this is going to be 
related to estimating something like the indirect effects here. Um, what I'm going to show in a few slides is an experimental design that lets you estimate the average indirect effect in a single marketplace. So we're not going to kind of marketplace wide shift supply and demand, which is kind of at the unit level, going to going to perturb their incentives and show how from that uh, you can recover uh, these these indirect effects. But yeah, that's a great question. This is clearly very close to that. Um, in a sense, uh, the, in, in working on this project, we've kind of tried to build things up uh, in terms of this kind of very abstract potential outcomes model. Uh, these price elasticities emerge uh, in the mean field limit. So that's a nice connection to kind of what people uh, typically do in econ. Um, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to estimate everything still and kind of much more of a potential outcomes randomized trial type uh, framework. Uh, but kind of digging deeper on this connection, I think, is a is a is a very uh, natural way to to go uh, on this agenda. Great, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions at this point? Uh, I think maybe you should uh, continue for now. All right. Thanks. So. All right. So so we have these limits. This is uh, perfect in terms of the previous question. Uh, now, now we need to understand how we actually uh, estimate these things. And it might not be a surprise that the direct effect is easier uh, to estimate than the indirect effect. And there's this recent paper um, by Sevi Arnor and Hudgens, um, where what they argue is essentially, if you have a generic um, experiment and you try to estimate the average treatment effect using a difference in means, uh, but there's actually interference that's present, you're going to end up estimating the average direct effect. And they prove that this happens in a number of settings. Their results don't cover this setting here, but you can extend their analysis uh, to see that the kind of main uh, same qualitative result holds. Um, and what you can check is that in the experiment, if you take the average outcome for the treated and control uh, units, um, you're going to be consistent with the average direct effect. So this is just a convergence and probability result to kind of highlight the conceptual connections between things. Uh, we'll have uh, more results, including a central limit theorem um, in the paper. So this is for the direct effect. What about the indirect effect? And here we need to do a little bit more work. Um, the average indirect effect so far, like, like a, if I'm following uh, Peter Hall's question, um, so far, I've been able to tell you what the indirect effect is, uh, but it's far from clear that the indirect effect is actually identified in a sense that you could measure it from a study where you only randomize a binary treatment. So um, in order to do that, we're gonna need to introduce um, more noise um, into the system. Uh, we're gonna need more signal. And the way we're gonna do this here um, is that we're going to generate small perturbations, zi, so that the prices experienced by the ith unit aren't the equilibrium price p, um, but they're the equilibrium price p plus some small perturbation zi. So this means that for each unit, um, the outcome that experience is no longer yi, wi, comma p, that's now wi, uh, p plus zi. And, um, P doesn't arise by kind of matching the unnoised supply and demand curves. Um, it's going to arise uh, by matching kind of the supply and demand curves with noise. And we're going to scale the perturbations so that the size of the perturbations in large systems is uh, zero. So this is what's going to enable us to estimate the indirect effect. Um, I just wanted to kind of give a few comments on this. Um, First, it might seem strange that kind of here prices form uh, endogenously. How can we uh, perturb these prices? Um, but in many cases in practice, say if you're a platform uh, who impo that imposes transaction fees, if you randomize transaction fees, uh, this is the kind of a very kind of seamless way of introducing this kind of price perturbations. Um, I wonder, this kind of small price perturbations 
they're very widely used in industry. Um, so I kind of feel <laughs> a sheepish citing, citing my own paper here, but in the, uh, in, in the academic literature, there's, there's less on them. But these are kind of, these kinds of experiments are very widely used in industry to essentially measure price elasticities. And finally, they're qualitatively related to these instrumental variables ideas where you kind of try to measure elasticities by considering global kind of marketplace wide um, up or down shifts in supply. The difference being that here you can measure price elasticities in a single marketplace, um, as opposed to by making cross marketplace comparisons. And so given this setting, um, here's, what, here's how we're gonna actually proceed. So this average indirect effect, right? It, in order to estimate it, we're gonna estimate two parts of it separately. First, this average price elasticity, how do outcomes respond to prices on average? And second, we're gonna look at how do prices change uh, when we uh, vary the treatment intensity. And we're gonna introduce these small price perturbations. The first result is that essentially, if you regress outcomes on these price perturbations, you recover this average price elasticity. So this kind of regression um, gives you the first part uh, of the indirect effect. So um, that, that's a good way to get started. The next thing we need is to understand how these equilibrium prices change with pi. And the way we're gonna do this is essentially you can check that um, this V pi P, this is a kind of measure of supply demand mismatch. Equilibrium prices need to supply set supply demand mismatch to zero. So um, the implicit function theorem then implies that the way prices change with pi is given by this formula. And by inspecting this formula, you can see that this thing looks a lot like a price elasticity, and this thing looks a lot like a direct effect. I'm going fast here in the interest of time. But the point is that once you see that this is like a direct effect, then this means that you can estimate this thing by taking a di difference in means on essentially supply and demand versus once you see that this thing looks like a price elasticity, then we're gonna be able to estimate it uh, using, using supply and demand. Um, sorry, 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 estimate it like we estimated the price elasticity in step one. And so this is gonna be the general setting and uh, then the, the result is that this estimator is actually going to be consistent for the average indirect effect. I think there's a question here. Uh, so maybe I'll pause to take a question. Uh, yes, we have a question from uh, Gabriel Weintraub, who you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, uh, Stefan. Super interesting. Thank you. So I have a question about, so the model seems to suggest that you're looking to a, a market of commodities, if I understood correctly, that there's no product differentiation. Uh, so in some of these marketplaces, I think that's, if ride sharing, that's probably the right assumption. If I think about other markets like labor markets or Airbnb, there's a lot of product differentiation where you may care about, you know, some sense of closeness or network structure in, product, in, the, in the product space. So, so have, have you thought about extending some of uh, these ideas to that setting? Would, would that be feasible, do you think? That's a, that's a great question. So yeah, here we here we assume that P is the capture the prices for J goods. So J may be moderately large, uh, but it's not going to be it's not going to be huge. Um, so that's right. If if there were, and uh, yeah, with, if there if there were kind of say geographic product differentiation where you care much more about say what the prices are in the hotel right down the street versus a block away versus on the other right. side of the city. Um, this would probably require kind of a hybrid of what we're doing here and kind of this network interference stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this would, this would, this would require, I, I hope you should be able to do everything in terms of something like this. There's again, an exposure mapping. You can define the average indirect and direct effects as before. Uh, but I think there, there would need to be many more comp components uh, to get this right. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Uh, and applying this kind of thing in practice, I, I imagine that it'd be an important consideration because in many yeah, settings, right. those differentiations matter. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot.
All right. In the in, to make sure that the, the discussant has time, also I'm going to try to um, wrap up um, pretty fast. So the goal of this talk was to kind of give, give some foundations in terms of a kind of basic uh, potential outcomes model for treatment effect estimation in a marketplace equilibrium setting. Um, so what we did is we formalized this problem uh, of kind of interference mediated by prices in terms of um, an exposure mapping model, uh, as is common uh, in the interference literature. Then kind of in studying this uh, model, we showed that kind of under IID sampling, um, in large samples, a mean field limit emerges where both the direct and indirect effects um, have natural uh, interpretable limits. Um, we showed that the direct effect can be estimated in the original trial via difference in means estimator. Um, the indirect effect is interesting, but it may not be identified in the original trial. However, we showed that you can run an augmented experiment with local price perturbations. And in this augmented experiment, you can also estimate the indirect effect of the original treatment. So the last thing I wanted to do uh, today is kind of show a little bit about what these things might look like in the, in the context of a, of a very simple application, um, just to show how everything uh, plays out. So this is again, a simulation example motivated by agricultural subsidies. We assume that each unit has a value VI for consuming a good and a cost uh, for producing a good, uh, sorry, and a cost a CI for producing a good. And these VIs and CIs can have an arbitrary joint distribution. Here, we're going to assume that the marketplace is two-sided, uh, meaning that everyone is either only going to consume or only going to produce. Um, either they have zero value uh, or, 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 or infinite costs. Um, so so uh, this is a two-sided marketplace. And we're also going to assume that each uh, marketplace participant can produce or consume uh, zero or one units. And we're interested in a treatment subsidy uh, that lowers the cost of producing one unit of corn here by A. So what does this mean? There's supply and demand curves. You're going to, if you're a supplier, you're going to supply a unit of corn if your costs are less than P minus if you're subsidized the subsidy amount. If you're a consumer, you're going to consume a unit of corn if your value is higher than the price. Very simple uh, supply demand model. And finally, let's say that the outcome we care about is seller profit. Uh, that is the expected value of kind of uh, um, what you earn uh, from selling a unit of corn minus how much you had to pay uh, for it. it. Should be the other way. And so we're going to run a, a randomized trial on subsidies. And what can you do here? First, you can estimate the direct effect. Um, we do so here. Remember, you can estimate the direct effect via difference in means. So the direct effect is also what you'd estimate kind of if you were naive and forgot about interference effects. And you find that the subsidy incre increases uh, production of corn by a lot. Um, on the other hand, if you remember that there are um, interference effects, then the total policy effect of um, then in estimating the total policy effect of the subsidy, you need to consider both the direct and the indirect effects. Uh, remember, like I mentioned earlier, in general, the sum of the direct and indirect effects is the total policy effect of the subsidy. And then once you use our method to estimate also the indirect effect, and then you sum the indirect and direct effects, then you get this distribution for the total uh, policy effect, which is much smaller uh, here, uh, less than half uh, of the direct effect of the subsidy. So this just highlights that in the setting, both the direct and indirect effect matter. And once you can estimate the indirect effect, you get a much uh, more realistic picture of the effect of the policy than otherwise. So anyways, this is the setting. Uh, we've studied uh, treatment effect estimation under marketplace equilibrium um, in a kind of classical potential outcome setting where interference is formalized using an exposure mapping. Um, and what we did is in, in doing so, we kind of took a large sample limit and in the mean field limit, which is interesting, is are kind of these familiar concepts from economics like price elasticities um, start to emerge. Um, today, I've talked about this kind of 
very much in the tradition of the randomized trials interference potential outcomes literature. So I've just kind of really tried to focus on how can you build notions of treatment effect estimates uh, from this perspective and see what you get. Um, but I think, of course, when you see these uh, kind of natural familiar quantities from uh, econ emerge, then a very natural question to ask is kind of what can you do uh, between the, the, these bridges um, uh, that, that emerge here? And I think further understanding the, the relevance of this work to kind of uh, classical ideas and econ, for example, can you use classical, um, say, instrumental variables based estimators to get at indirect effects in this model? Or vice versa, can you use results developed here to, to develop new experimental design schemes um, to get at quantities people care about in industrial organization? Uh, that would be very interesting for further investigation. But that's all I had for you today. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks for the very nice talk, Stefan. We're now switching over to discussion. So we'll have uh, Frederick present some slides. And after that, Stefan will have the opportunity to respond. Uh, Frederick, whenever you're ready. Uh, I am ready. Thank you very much. And thank you for that nice talk. Um, so this, this paper adds to the small but growing literature on uh, global interference. So as Stefan mentioned, most of the interference literatures look at local interference and in particular local and known interference using this uh, idea of exposure mapping from, from Arnon Sami and Maske before that. And once we assume that these exposure mappings, are, when they are local and known and they are correctly specified, the interference problem reduces to a setting of sutva with a complex design. So it's basically, we are assuming away the interference problem or we are, we are exchanging interference for having a complex design. So there's been some work uh, on local but unknown interference, in which case we can't do that, that trick of kind of assuming away the interference. And another setting where we can't assume, assume away the interference is when we have a global interference. And there's much, uh, very little work on, on global interference, at least that I'm aware of in this causal inference literature of, of using exposure mapping potential outcomes. So Stefan has a paper previously, I, I have a paper that is also tackling this from a from a very different perspective or a slightly different perspective. And then the current paper is also uh, contributing to this. And I, I'm sure that I've missed some papers here, but, but it is a, a much smaller literature. So the focus in, in this talk is on the average direct and indirect effect. So I, I, I wanted to, to illustrate that with this, this graph, which is giving me a lot of, of intuition about this. So this mu function here is related to the mu function in, in Stefan's talk. But it's slightly different. So it's not P, it is this uh, treatment propensity instead. So this is the expectation of the outcome for either a treated or a control unit when we are marginalizing over the, all other units treated given a certain design. So given is a certain treatment propensity. So what is graphed here is the, is the curves of the average outcome for treated units for different treatment propensities for treated, treated and controlled units. So what we see is that for low treatment propensities, treated units has lower outcomes, and as the treatment propensity increases, they get higher outcomes, still remaining treated. So the direct effect here is the difference of these two curves at the, the treatment propensity that was actually implemented. So in this case, uh, pi star. So that is the, the direct effect. The indirect effect is related to the slopes of these curves. So this is the slope. Uh, at this point for the treated units. So this is how much on average, the average outcome changes for a treated unit while we increase the treatment propensity. We, we, we do not change the treatment for that units, for those units, but just change, change the unit, um, treatment for other units. And the indirect effect is the average of the slope for the treated unit and the control units where the weights are weighted with the treatment propensities. So this is the average indirect effect in the general setting where we don't have this, this, this price structure that, that Stefan was, was talking about. Okay, so the, the direct effect is generally quite straightforward to, to estimate. We can estimate that under much weaker assumptions than are assumed in, in, in this talk. But the average indirect effect is very tricky to estimate, especially when we have global interference. And, and the reason for that, right, is that the indirect effect trying to trying to uh, measure the influence of every unit on every other unit. So there's no well-defined concept of treated units or control units. Basically, everyone is treated the same, more or less. 
So to, to get a handle on this, what, what Stefan and co-authors are doing, they are making two key assumptions. So unit responses only depend on treatment and market price. And the market price um, is unique and stable in large N. So, so basically that in large N, treatment assignment does not induce any instability in the equilibrium. So we have some type of stability. That doesn't mean that there's no indirect effect. It just means that we don't have like large shifts in the, in the, in the equilibrium. And in this setting, the indirect effect decomposes into this price elasticity on the outcome and the treatment effect on the price. And here we can see the inferential problem, and that is that we only have one market price here, right? So in this part, in this term here, the, the price is the independent variable, and here the price is the dependent variable. But we also observe one market price here because of one market. So it seems that we can't really estimate these. Here we have no variability, and here we have only one observation. So the way to solve this, the way to, to have to induce variability is to use this augmented experiment. So you have union-wise price perturbations, uh, but that won't help us with the second part. So when, when price is the dependent variable and the way they solve that is to impose a very light structural model, just to assume that prices are set to clear markets. And as Stefan mentioned, that seems very reasonable in this setting. And then they show that we can, we can estimate this, uh, provided that we observe supply and demand, and that supply and demand only depends on treatment and market price, similar to the, to the outcome. Okay, so I, I really like this, this, this paper, this talk. This seems absolutely to be the right way of doing this. Um, it, this, this connection between the kind of causal, traditional causal inference literature and the econ literature is, is very nice and seems uh, as, precisely the way to, to tackle this. So uh, generally correctly specified exposure mapping is a strong assumption. It, it often doesn't really hold exactly at least, but in this setting, it seems to be very reasonable, right? It seems to that at least in a commodity market, people will react to price uh, at least primarily. And the stable equilibrium prices also seems reasonable, at least in markets with many small agents. If we have um, uh, agents with market power, then we might be worried. The one potential concern that I didn't really understand how you how you tackle is market entry and exit, which you don't seem to be able to to measure here. But maybe I'm I'm, I'm missing something. Um, and to me, the, the the key contribution here is the, the estimation of the, the treatment effect on price. Uh, so the, the perturbations are I mean it's a, a very nice way of solving it, but um, uh, uh, to me the, the the treatment effect on price was uh, very nice that you can solve it. It seems basically impossible to do, uh, and this very kind of light structural model it was ingenious. So a couple of comments and, and, and questions. Um, so the, the first comment was about the nudge effect or the overall effect, which is the same as the total policy effect. So these, uh, my discussion is based on previous, uh, previous version of the slides where that wasn't included, but um, I, I find that that is often more policy relevant than the, the indirect and direct effect. Uh, so uh, Stefan also already answered that that is possible to, to, uh, to investigate here. Uh, in particular, this relationship holds uh, where, where this, the sum is equal to the total effect. Um, the second question is about uh, uh, on policy analysis. So as I understand it, everything here is on policy. It's relative to the changes to treatment propensity at the, the equilibrium price. And often this makes sense primarily because we can make much weaker assumptions. And in many cases, policy changes tend to be incremental in any way, so it's, it is local. But it seems that you have enough structure here to be able to say something about all policy effect. It's, maybe you need to be able to do larger price perturbations, um, but, but it seems that you should be able to get a handle of, of, uh, of policy effects. So, so maybe you can speak a bit uh, about that. Um, and related to that, it seems like you should do, be able to do much more here. So in this setting, the equilibrium behavior is completely determined by supply and demand functions, if I understand. And because you control in this augmented experiments the, the prices that the agent means, it seems that you'll be able to estimate these functions in, in a wider, in a bigger neighborhood than just very close in, in epsilon neighborhood around the, the equilibrium price and maybe even globally. And, and in that case, wouldn't you be able to characterize the full behavior of this, this market? And in that case, why, why would we be interested in the, in the average indirect effect? Uh, so so that, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, third point is the experimental setting. So here, 
as I understand it, the experiment and the market is the same thing. So all market participants are in the experiment. But in, in some cases, and in many cases perhaps, the experiment will be much more than the market. So this might not be the case if, if it is uh, a ride sharing app or, or something like that, where basically the, the experimenter controls the market. But in, in some cases, we, we won't be able to, to control the whole market. And in that case, even if the treatment propensity is positive in the experiment, it will be effectively zero in the market if, if the experiment is much smaller. And that means that the indirect effect in the experiment is potentially much or different than the one in the market, but not quite in the same way that one first might think. It's not because of selection, it's because of what it means to increase the treatment propensity here. So if equilibrium price is unaffected by treatment in the experiment, then this will just be zero, right, by, by definition. But that doesn't mean that, that the equilibrium price is unaffected by treatment in the market. So we could still have an indirect effect in the market. And at first glance, it seems that we won't be able to get a handle of this. But again, I think you have enough structure here to be able to estimate this, even if the experiment is much smaller than the, the market. So um, maybe you could speak to that as well. And finally, um, so I'm a political scientist and I'm interested in, in other things than markets. And so we were very curious to see if one can extend these ideas to a non-market setting. And, and two things make me a bit pessimistic about this. So the mean field limit is a reasonable assumption in a market setting, but in many other settings. So for example, in a, in a canvassing to get out to vote experiment, we probably don't have any, any good way of, of characterizing the, the equilibrium behavior in, in a, in a uh, finite on a small dimensional null vector. And what seems to be even harder is to estimate the treatment effect on the mean field parameter. So we would need a much more elaborate structural model. And so my questions are if it's possible to relax this mean field assumption, in particular going from interference only through price to interference mostly through price or, or whatever the, the, the mean field parameter is, that, that seems to extend to be able to extend this, this method to many more settings. And also alternative ways to estimate uh, the mean field parameter itself using a reduced form approach rather than a structural model. And then finally, what would we do if we uh, don't have unit level perturbations? And I realized that this is taking this way beyond the setting that you're looking at. And so uh, I, there's, I, I suspect that many of the answers to, to these questions on this slide will be no, but, but I'm still curious to hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you very much for a, a super nice talk. Yeah, and th 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 thanks, th thanks, Frederick, for the for the really nice discussion. I, I think I, I agree with the, everything you say. These are very very nice you know, very nice points, and kind of uh, thank thanks a lot also for kind of showing these nice pictures of the direct and indirect effect and ex explaining how to think about this. I think these are these are very helpful pictures. Um, so now in terms of the questions you're asking, and I think you're kind of right, right, right on target in terms of um, uh, limitations and choices in the, in the work. So first you mentioned this focus on we're looking at small perturbations and we're looking at this kind of marketplace model where the mean field emerges. And, and of course, these were choices. Um, it, it, these these are choices. We we tried a number of different things along the, the road, right? So these were kind of choices that that made everything work. Um, interference in general, I mean, it's it's just a very hard problem, and this is what we're trying to do here: show one kind of reasonably general and practically relevant setting where kind of things actually work out. But I completely agree, and. Um, that as soon as you start relaxing some of these things, you have too much granularity that the mean field phenomena don't, don't show up anymore. The problem just gets much, much harder. So completely agree with that. Um, on the small perturbations, so kind of what I like about the small perturbations is that kind of locally, you have this kind of implicit function theorem type phenomena, where if you know the derivatives of the supply, demand, and kind of outcome curves uh, with respect to, to price, you can do everything. And everything kind of, you're in the simple linear world. Um, so everything just becomes very transparent. Um, this is a similar insight that's kind of exploited in what's called the sufficient statistics literature in econ. Um, uh, Raj Chetty has a nice uh, review paper on that stuff, uh, where just kind of the local policy changes 
everything can be done in terms of relationships between different derivatives. You could do global stuff also. And I, I, I agree this could be done. It could be very relevant in some cases. Um, maybe you want to kind of start looking at non-linearity in the supply and demand curves um, in terms of price. And this could give you kind of really nice insights. Um, one reason we haven't gone here in, in, in this paper as of now is that getting these derivatives, you can do these with very small price perturbations. And if, if let's say, remember you need to put these price perturbations, there's a kind of $1 transaction fee. For some people you randomize the transaction for to 95 cents and the other half of people you make it $1 and five cents. That's pretty cheap. Um, if you control prices, but you start like deploying crazy prices to learn the whole curve, that's gonna be very, very expensive. So you can do it, but I think as much as this kind of experiment I'm talking about here, I'm confident that kind of given a marketplace kind of organizer with the kind of technical expertise, this is kind of something that's realistic to run. Um, trying to explore the whole supply demand curves is non-parametric, it's gonna be very expensive. Uh, there might be some people who would be willing to run those experiments, but it's a much bigger ask. Um, but yeah, that's a very good um, point. Uh, finally, kind of for two of the, the more specific uh, questions, market entry and exit. That's a very good point. I think that's, that's something we don't have here. Uh, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I, I kind of, one answer could be, you just have a lot of people in the marketplace who most of the time don't participate. So actually the number of people who actually do anything in the market is kind of a Poisson random variable. And you have something that looks like market entry just because you had a bunch of kind of potential marketplace participants, but who don't participate. Um, genuine market entry and exit, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know if that would require new ideas to integrate into here. Um, the question you had about uh, predicting market level wide indirect effects from a very small experiment, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's not one I uh, thought about so far. I need to think about uh, more to give a good answer, but, but that's a very nice question. Anyways, you, you had a number of, of very good questions here that I haven't gotten, gotten into yet. Uh, I'm happy to follow up, but I think now in the interest of time, uh, I, should, I should stop talking. But again, thanks for the very nice uh, discussion. And yeah, I think you really kind of uh, hit, the, hit the nail uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of a number, a number of points here. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I think it's time to now slowly uh, wrap up. So first of all, thank you so much, Stefan, for a very uh, interesting talk. Thank you, uh, Frederick, for a nice discussion. And thank you, Evan, for uh, helping out in Q&A. Uh, next time, we're going to have Sam Pimentel from UC Berkeley, who will talk about optimal trade-offs in match designs, comparing US trained and internationally trained surgeons. We're very much looking forward to the talk. Thank you all for coming, and uh, see you next time.